The prison at Greenhaven is situated in upstate New York's Dutchess County Center. The huge, 20-foot-thick walls that enclose the institution are over 30 feet tall in certain locations. Machine-gun-wielding guards with stern expressions are stationed inside the turrets that surround the compound. Nearly 1,700 people were incarcerated in Greenhaven in May 1981, of whom almost 1,000 were found guilty of crimes related to murder. At Greenhaven, some of the worst criminals in the state were detained. The prison guards were acutely aware of the risks associated with their work because this was a maximum security facility. Because the majority of inmates were used to violence and had nothing to lose, any form of inmate insurrection would undoubtedly result in carnage. The 540 correctional officers were responsible for keeping an eye on and managing a potentially hostile inmate population. Everyone who worked in a prison in New York was still thinking about the violent revolt in Attica in 1971, which resulted in the deaths of numerous prisoners and officers. Donna Payon, a 31-year-old corrections officer, was slated to work the 1 p.m. to 9 p.m. change on May 15. She had only recently been transferred from upstate Clinton Prison and had only been employed at Greenhaven for a month. At 12.08 p.m., Officer Pion punched her time card. And started lining up after that. At 12.45 p.m., following the morning roll call, Pion sauntered down to the officer's mess hall and bought a coke. She was assigned to patrol the A.B. section of the jail yard that afternoon. Pion was moving through one of the prison's halls at around 12.55 p.m. with correction officers Claude King and Barbara Hinson. When a nearby phone rang, Hinson answered it. As Hinson gave her the phone receiver, she informed Pion that the call was for her. In a later statement, King described Donna Pion as being hunched over like she was trying to hear. Hello, said Pion. She seemed to be paying close attention to the caller. She responded after a brief delay. She said, who? What? Yes. Okay, and then hung up. Then Pion informed Officer King that something went wrong and that she needed to have it fixed. She left and headed for the chaplain's office, which was behind one of the hospital's mess halls and off the main hospital corridor. She said she would be back in a few minutes. A few minutes later, Teddy Goodman, an inmate, remained in a tiny niche next to the chaplain's office. Goodman had been incarcerated at Greenhaven since his conviction in the Bronx murder of his business partner in 1977. He observed Pion enter the office. A few months later, he recalled, she had strawberry blonde hair. She had a sizable cup of soda in her hand and her uniform jacket was folded over one arm. Another prisoner, a tall black man with mesmerizing eyes whose name Goodman did not know, was with her. Goodman had previously seen this man erect a huge metal drum in front of the church door. The man painted the metal container after thoroughly cleaning it. He left the garbage can in the drum at the door for later use. Since then, Goodman has observed the man repeatedly empty the drum as part of his routine errands. The black man kept the door open for Pion when she and the prisoner arrived at the end of the hallway, and they entered without any problems. Goodman lingered around for a little longer, puffing on cigarettes and chit-chatting with other inmates. Around 2.45 p.m., he went back to the chapel entrance. Goodman went to empty some trash when he saw the trash can was gone. A roll call was conducted for new assignments and shift changes for some correctional officers at 6 p.m. in the turnout room. Along with the other guards who were supposed to leave for the day, Donna Pion was scheduled to report for her next job she failed to appear. Correction officer Donna Pion's inability to show up for her roll call at 6 p.m. was reported to prison authorities right away. At first, guards made phone calls all throughout the institution in an effort to find her. She was new to Greenhaven, thus it was speculated that she might have become diverted for an unforeseen reason. However, managers picked up on the issue right away. Pion never showed up for any of her afternoon responsibilities, they found out. In a prison, not responding to a task is a significant offense. Every available correctional officer searched the vast institution physically in an effort to find the missing officer. There was no sign of her by 8 p.m. The warden issued an immediate lockdown order, 
which keeps everyone confined to their cells until further notice. The search went on into the tense evening. A special 200-man search team arrived at the facility just after 1 a.m. to help the jail staff. They brought highly trained bloodhounds to find Donna Pion's scent. The dogs continued into the A and D blocks and along the east and west corridors. Despite being escorted into the medical area, they made no clear reactions. The chapel area was not visited with the dogs. Outside the mess hall, two enormous dumpsters could be seen in the jail yard. Some of the waste produced by the factory was dumped in these containers. In fact, two cops went through the foul waste in the metal containers without discovering anything. Hundreds of state police, guards, and prison employees scoured every inch two of Greenhaven all night long in search of the missing correction officer as lights remained on. She seemed to be nowhere to be found, which seemed impossible. There were some who even believed she had entirely escaped the jail without being spotted. But after finding and speaking with every gatekeeper, officials promptly ruled out that option. There was no possible way for an officer to leave the prison unnoticed. Each cell block was first thoroughly searched by guards, and then each individual cell. The industry buildings were searched from the roofs to the cellars, and the mess halls were flipped on their sides. On Saturday, May 16, early in the morning, a garbage truck was dispatched to empty the dumpsters. Officers watched as the garbage was thrown into the rear of the truck as it was being filled with the contents of the bins while they waited nearby with flashlights. They didn't notice anything odd. Each dumpster was cleaned out and compacted. The car was allowed to exit the Greenhaven facility after it was fully loaded. After that, the waste was transported to the regular landfill near the town of Armenia, which is about 20 miles from the prison. Peter Cooper, a civilian employee, was the driver of the garbage truck that was escorted to the dump site by two prison officers. The trash was strewn out on the ground and thoroughly investigated after the truck had dumped its load. The dozer operator saw a human leg protruding from a green plastic bag at about 10.30 a.m. Cooper moved closer to the location. He later admitted, I saw about an inch of stomach and let go of the bag. That was it. When the police arrived, they discovered Donna Pion's body wrapped in three plastic bags. Her hands were restrained behind her. A dark chain was securely wrapped around her neck, and her uniform was torn. She suffered significant cuts to her lips, nose, and eyelids. There were weird marks on her cheek and neck, and it appeared as though her nipples had been either chopped off or bit off. The murder of Donna Pion had an impact not only on New York's prison system but also on others. On May 18, her burial was attended by more than 5,000 law enforcement personnel from all around the country in the village of Danny Mora. In a formal statement issued from Albany, Governor Hugh Carey stated that Mrs. Pion's murder resulted from an act of unconscionable violence which will be met with a swift response. In upstate New York, in the town of Danny Mora, Donna Collins grew up. Edwin J. Collins, her father, was a corrections officer who spent more than 28 years in the infamous Clinton prison. After Donna married Leo Pion, who was also a Clinton corrections officer, she settled down and had three kids later on. Due to the high financial demands of a big family, Donna had to take on a number of low-paying occupations in order to increase her income. But in the end, she chose to work as a correctional officer. She reportedly questioned her husband, why should I work for seven or eight thousand dollars when I can double that? She was one of 634 officers who enrolled in the Albany-based academy in late 1980. New York was in desperate need of correction officers, in part due to the Attica Prison Revolt of 1971. Donna had light blonde hair, which made her look lovely, and a charming grin. Although all the inmates at Greenhaven were male, there were over 50 female officers at the facility. She made friends quickly and even socialized with the inmates. She was 5 feet 5 inches with a very slim build, but she was confident in her job and looked forward to a career in corrections. She commuted from Greenhaven to her home in Danny Mora on occasion, a long trip of several hundred miles. She expressed hope that, in time, she could obtain a transfer to an institution closer to home. 
head of the Bureau of Criminal Investigation for the New York State Police Captain Francis DeFrancesco took charge of the investigation into the murder of America's first female corrections officer while the search for Pion was still ongoing on May 16. There are 1,000 suspects, he told the press. Half of the population, or at least a good percentage, has a manslaughter charge against them. The process of separating the inmates and tracking each one's movements on May 15 had begun. Our first priority, said Captain DeFrancesco later, went to court. It was decided that another autopsy should be performed by a different medical examiner and Dr. Michael Barden, then a deputy medical examiner for the city of New York, was called in. He performed the second autopsy on Payan on May 19 and discovered several additional facts about her injuries. The cause of death was strangulation, achieved by a Venetian blind cord that was found tightly wrapped around the victim's neck. Payan had wounds to her skull, though not fatal, that would have rendered her unconscious. Injuries to the rectal area indicated an assault with a blunt object, possibly a wooden mop handle. Dr. Barden also concluded that the victim's nipples had been partially amputated by human bites. Although Pion had post-mortem lesions that were most likely inflicted by the bulldozer, she also had several bite marks on her breast and face. Furthermore, those bite marks were of sufficient quality that Dr. Barden felt they could be matched with an assailant. It was an extremely important development since there were no fingerprints found on any of Pion's belongings or her uniform. Her ID card and badge were later discovered hidden in a closet in a distant cell block. They, too, revealed no latent prints. Hairs were found inside her belt buckle that could not be matched to any one individual. No immediate suspects and no witnesses to the event were found. After she passed away, Donna Pion would have to identify her killer. Detectives soon learned about the phone call that took Donna Pion away from her fellow officers, no witnesses came forward, speculation was that it could have been another supervisor who made a late change of assignment and informed Pion where she should respond, however, that theory was quickly disproved when every supervisor on duty at the time of the call was identified and questions were asked of them. Rumors circulated within the prison walls that Pion had been killed because she discovered that some of the guards were dealing drugs to the inmates, but there was no proof that the rumor was true. Police began the arduous task of interviewing all the inmates who had any possible contact with the victim, which consisted of over 200 prisoners, most of whom were uncooperative. However, some of the prisoners raised the possibility that Pion was killed by another guard. We currently don't have a way to verify it. State correctional officials responded to oversee the management of the prison and to monitor the development of the criminal investigation. In the meantime, the lockdown continued, raising tensions and adding pressure on Greenhaven authorities to expedite the case. Police were perplexed as to how a guard could disappear inside a maximum security facility without anyone being aware of it for several hours. But prison guards knew better. But throughout the course of a day, it feels like you are in a city's streets. It would be simple for someone, especially one who is familiar with the layout of the prison, to disappear for a while. Greenhaven is a 37-acre facility with a dozen cell blocks, a hospital, a church, industry buildings, mess halls, an athletic field, numerous basements, corridors, its own school, administrative building, and dozens of offices and storage areas. A rookie correction officer from the Albany Academy showed up in Greenhaven on the day of the murder, just visiting the facility as part of her training program, but several inmates and guards mistook her for the victim reporting seeing the female guard in the late afternoon, placing the time of death much later than it actually was. With the help of the driver and the location of the body, investigators were able to determine that the remains of Pion were in the front of the truck, indicating that the body was picked up with the first load of garbage. However, when detectives looked further, they found that the first dumpster consignment was a dumpster consignment, which meant that the body was picked up with the first load of garbage. Alfredo Diaz, an inmate, was taken to the chaplain's office by correction officer Martin Rahali on the day of the murder at approximately 1.30 p.m. Rahali claimed that he was there to make a phone call to one of Diaz's relatives. As they entered the office, Rahali noticed that it was in disarray, 
papers and desk items were scattered on the floor as if some force had knocked them over, he later testified in court. Officer Rahali opened the door and saw a prisoner standing there with a plastic bag under his arm, he recognized the prisoner as one who worked in the chapel, and allowed the man to enter. As soon as the prisoner saw Officer Rahali, he calmed down and walked to the rear office while Diaz continued to make his phone call. A few minutes later, the same prisoner emerged from the rear office carrying a 55-gallon drum of garbage, according to Rahali's. Lemuel Warren Smith was born in the city of Amsterdam in central New York in 1941. Prior to his birth, his parents had another son, John, who passed away at the age of 11 months, this issue would be brought up later in Smith's life when court psychiatrists said this event had a traumatic impact on Smith's psychological development. A month later, on December 23, 1976, 42-year-old Joan Richburg was kidnapped from the Colony Shopping Mall in New York and taken to a deserted area of a parking lot where she was sexually assaulted and killed. Her throat had been slit, and her body had been savagely mutilated. B. On Thanksgiving Eve in 1976, Robert Hederman, the owner of a religious store in downtown Albany, and his assistant, Margaret. Mary Lee Wilson, 30, was kidnapped from downtown Schenectady in July 1977. Smith, who was being held for the Albany murders, confessed to this crime to state police in 1978 and described in detail what he had done to the victim. He said he took her to a wooded area where he stomped her to death. He said he flung her body into trees. He said he rammed sticks into her mouth and other parts of. Smith was later examined by Dr. Tsavi Kloppert, a court-appointed psychiatrist, who testified at the Hederman Byron murders trial. He said that Smith had a conflict in his mind that focused upon his dead brother, John. Kloppert said that Smith believed John was a messenger from the devil and whenever Smith committed an assault or murder, he thought John would protect him from punishment. Somehow, Dr. Kloppert concluded, this rage generated from Smith's upbringing and a strong resentment to his mother. Women he attacked are projections of his mother, he told the court in 1978, the rage he feels automatically flows into John because Smith cannot accept the rage as belonging to him. But a prosecution psychiatrist later testified that Smith was a manipulator and played the court system well. He said Smith fabricated mental illness because he knew he would get a lighter sentence. I've done some terrible things, he later told the court, some hideous things, things I have to face every day in the mirror. Smith was convicted of the Hederman Byron murders and received two 25-to-life sentences. The bite impressions on the victim's body were examined by forensic odontologist Dr. Lowell Levine after Schenectady detectives asked him to do so. Dr. Levine found that the bite impressions on the victim's body matched the teeth of Lemuel Smith, and on the basis of that evidence, Smith was indicted for the murder of Ms. Wilson as well as the Joan Richburg murder in Schenectady, to which he also confessed. A forensic odontologist is a dentist who is qualified to make an expert determination on such evidence, and in many cases, those conclusions can determine the guilt or innocence of a defendant. One of the most well-known bite mark cases in history occurred in Florida in the 1970s. In addition to being a brutal, sadistic killer, Ted Bundy was also a biter, who delighted in biting his victims both during and after their sexual assaults. One of his victims, Lisa Levy, 20, suffered bite marks on her body that were of high qualitative value. These wounds were compared to an impression of Bundy's teeth and were shown to be a perfect match. The significance of their application typically depends on the quality of the impressions. Generally, the more pronounced the bite mark, the more likely a comparison will be successful. White mark comparisons are not, contrary to what is depicted on television, irrefutable. At times, they can be subject to individual interpretation due to several factors. Human skin is not the ideal medium for a bite mark. Dr. Lowell Levine, one of the forensic odontologists called in by Dr. Michael Barden, noticed the similarities between the two murder victims as soon as he examined the injuries to Donna Pion's chest and reported his findings to Captain DeFrancesco of the New York State Police. 
The bite marks on the body of Donna Pion matched the bite mark evidence in the Mary Lee Wilson case in 1977. On June 1, 1981, Smith was formally arrested and charged with Donna Pion's murder. Because he was already serving a life sentence, New York state law mandated that if Smith were found guilty of murder, he would be subject to a mandatory death penalty. The startling results of Dr. Levine's comparison were strong evidence against Smith, and for the prosecution, it was the last piece in the puzzle of her death. C. Vernon Mason, general counsel for the National Conference of Black Lawyers at the time, was chosen to defend Smith. Later, Mason would join New York City's Alton Maddox and Reverend Al Sharpton for the Tawana Brawley hoax of 1987. But Mason would not be alone for long. Abby Hoffman, the political activist from the 1960s, was being held in the nearby Fishkill Correctional Facility on an unrelated drug charge. Early in June 1981, William Kunstler joined the campaign to spare Lemuel Smith from the electric chair. You ought to get into this, he said. Apparently, that was enough for Kunstler. I can say Abby is a pretty good observer of life, he told reporters the next day. William Kunstler, a civil rights lawyer and activist who was first known for representing the Chicago Seven in the conspiracy trial of 1970 and defending prisoners accused of participating in the bloody prison riot at Attica in 1971, had a reputation for taking on unpopular and controversial causes long before 1981, so when he accepted the Smith case, it seemed natural to plan a strategy. With a white woman, a black inmate, he mused, there's enough smoke around that anyone with a sensitive nose like mine would do something about it. Kunstler noted that in a case like this one, there was a great deal of pressure to get a conviction. Smith is terribly vulnerable, he told reporters, if you want to pick a victim, that's precisely the kind you want. Lemuel Smith's Schenectady-based mother, Mrs. Mildred Smith, shared her sentiments, saying, I feel he was framed to reporters for the Poughkeepsie Journal. My son is black, she added, and naturally we're always discriminated against. But there was more, and Kunstler raised the spectre of official corruption, hinting that perhaps the situation was not as straightforward as the authorities would have the public believe. Guards at Greenhaven were transferred to other institutions during the murder investigation without explanation, and there were persistent rumors of an ongoing investigation into drug dealing by prison guards at Greenhaven, so it was possible, Kunstler said, that guards were involved. There were already rumors of Pion's infidelity at the prison and Kunstler was ready to exploit those issues. We don't say these things are true, he later told a judge, we don't want to embarrass her husband or Mrs. Pion's memory. But no action of the defense team raised such fury as when Kunstler announced that the victim's reputation was fair game in a courtroom. The victim would have to be dragged through the muck to assist save her killer, though, as we have a client who is up for the death penalty. On the morning of June 10, Smith was brought to Dutchess County Court for a court appearance and when asked who he wanted for an attorney, he claimed ignorance. I don't understand what's happening, he said to the court, I haven't seen an attorney yet. That was because at that very moment, Kunstler and Mason were holding a press conference. In front of the barbed wire gates, Kunstler gasped to reporters about his new client, there is no probable cause, adding that he is, in essence, a scapegoat. Lemuel Smith's defense team was informed of the evidence against their client in June 1981. Not only were there witnesses who could place Lemuel Smith with the victim at the scene of the murder, but the bite evidence was extremely damaging. Something had to be done to either discredit that testimony or get other experts to challenge the outcomes of the comparison made by the prosecution's side, so Kunstler and Mason chose to hire another forensic odontologist. At the time, Dr. Neil Reesner was a consultant for the New York City Medical Examiner's Office and a diplomat in the American Board of Forensic Odontology. When they asked me to examine the bite marks in both cases, he said in a recent interview, I knew the results would be critical. On July 2, 1981, the defense provided Dr. Reesner with a mold of Lemuel Smith's teeth and several other items. Actually, it wasn't that difficult. Lemuel Smith left a bite mark on Donna Pion's body. Then, according to Dr. Reesner, he dialed the defense team's number and spoke with C. Vernon Mason, telling him my findings. 
Mason asked Dr. Reesner if it mattered that Smith had lost a tooth since the Wilson murder, and the doctor responded, not in this case. In this bite mark, the impression is only of the lower set of teeth, which is sometimes the case. Many bite marks consist of upper and lower, but some do not. It depends on a variety of variables, including the victim's movement, the biter's mobility, and other elements, he said. I know that may not have helped the defense, but that was the truth, Dr. Reesner said. It wasn't the result they wanted, but they have to realize that forensics experts are going to give the same opinion no matter who hires them, he added. Since the Pion case, he has testified in dozens of criminal cases for both the prosecution and the defense. Additionally, they never compensated me for my services. Smith was incarcerated in Downstate Correctional Institution at Fishkill during 1982 while attorneys Kunstler and Mason prepared their case. While there, he wrote letters to numerous county and state officials complaining about everything from the quality of the food, racial discrimination, and abuse from prison staff. In a 70-page letter to County Court Judge Raymond E. Aldrich, complete with chapter divisions, page numbers, and drawings, Smith claimed that his life had been made a living hell and that he had been Smith wrote, it's quite evident that corrections personnel do carry deadly clubs, and Mr. Rogers, a prisoner who had recently committed suicide, and Donna Pion erase all doubt about corrections personnel being potential murderers. He also mused that no county judge who was sympathetic to his case could ever be re-elected, and that Department of Corrections, affiliated agencies, their friends and associates have adjudged me guilty, before trial, and have become pariahs. Smith was also aware of the Pion case's significance and the contentious nature of New York's death sentence law. The death penalty laws cannot be tested unless I am found guilty, and many politicians have already taken positions in the upcoming debate, and the only hold-up is a guilty verdict in Dutchess County Court, Smith wrote in his letter, referring to her as the only female correction officer who has been murdered while allegedly on duty inside of a maximum security correctional facility. Due to the fact that the jury is to be selected from Dutchess County where a significant portion of the population is Department of Corrections personnel, and those affiliated with the Department of Corrections, this was the case. Smith had confessed to killing at least five people, according to police investigators, and may have killed even more. Despite his claims of innocence, Smith was not exactly a typical American citizen. He had spent most of his adult life in prison after being found guilty of two brutal murders in 1977. The court had to deal with each motion, which at times took weeks to review, that Kunstler and Mason brought before it over the course of the following months, involving matters such as trial venue, applications for case dismissal, witness credibility, special prosecutor, and various conspiracy theories, most of which involved prison guards murdering Pion to silence her about renegade correction officers. However, the defense had run out of options by the end of 1982, and the trial was finally set for January 1983. The special prosecutor, William Stanton, had studied the evidence in the case and was prepared for the heated atmosphere of a William Kunstler defense. The DA's office knew that Pion's reputation, the conduct of the guards at the facility, and the state's investigation into Greenhaven would be the issues to be explored. However, prosecutors were confident that Lemuel Smith was guilty. Witnesses testified in court that the prison resembled a miniature city with its own hospital, supplies, schools, and support staff, and that it would be very possible for an unattended inmate to walk through the prison corridors pushing trash cans or emptying containers into dumpsters. Stanton then outlined the situation at the prison at the time Donna Pion arrived in April 1981. Robert D. Boner was incarcerated at Fishkill Correctional Facility in May 1981 when he spoke with Lemuel Smith. He was in an emotional, tense state, D. Boner said to the hushed courtroom. That he deserved to die since he shouldn't have made the phone call. Kunstler attempted to discredit D. Boner by demonstrating that he merely desired better treatment in return for his testimony, but D. Boner refuted this claim, saying that the words relate to acts so disgusting and so low I didn't feel I could live with myself. Teddy Goodman, the prisoner who loitered outside the chaplain's office on the day of the murder, also gave testimony, when Stanton showed him a picture of Donna Pion, 
Goodman had no trouble recognizing her, this is the woman I told you I saw go into the chaplain's office with Smith, he said. The testimony was damaging, and the defense was aware of it. Kunstler later remarked that Goodman was a very smart cookie, he got the best deal. Given immunity from prosecution, correction officer Rahali testified about his own drug abuse throughout the years and narcotic sales inside the prison walls. I did bring in a quantity of drugs for which I expected to be repaid, Rahali said. Rahali also admitted to selling drugs outside the prison for years. Kunstler later said he had never seen a drug dealer of suaveness. The scene was set for the most significant and devastating testimony of all after a month of testimony that gradually put together the jigsaw of how Donna Pion could have been attacked and killed inside Greenhaven's walls. Up until the forensic odontologists appeared on the witness stand, defense attorneys realized there was no direct link between their client and the murder of correction officer Pion. Witnesses had placed Smith and the victim together just before the crime occurred but the actual time of the murder was still not firmly established. Additionally, no fingerprints were recovered at the crime scene, which was thought to be the rear of the chaplain's office. Prosecutors knew that the bite mark evidence was the most crucial portion of their case. Mary Lee Wilson, the woman so brutally slaughtered in the city of Schenectady in 1977, was about to have justice done. Bite marks that she suffered during her savage assault were ruled admissible in the Smith trial, despite defense efforts to have them excluded. The source of these bite marks was not in dispute since they had already been examined and determined to be from the teeth of Lemuel Smith. And Smith had once confessed to the Wilson murder, thereby offering even further proof that those bite marks, in fact, belonged to him. In his testimony, Dr. Lowell Levine, a forensic odontologist who had previously worked on the Wilson case, compared the bite marks on Pion's breast to the wounds Wilson had sustained. Have you ever conducted a scientific comparison between the bite mark you discovered on the Donna Pion image and the bite mark you discovered in the Mary Lee Wilson case? The prosecutor inquired. Although Kunstler sought to cast doubt on Dr. Levine's assertion, he was unfazed. It was Smith's bite, of that he was certain. Yes, sir. Dr. Levine said, it is my opinion that the two bite marks were made by the same set of teeth. Dr. Neil Reesner was asked to testify by the prosecution on April 7, 1983. Although I was originally engaged by the defense, he noted in a subsequent interview, they had no notion that I may be testifying. However, following a protracted in-chambers discussion regarding the limitations of Dr. Reesner's testimony, it was ruled that he could not mention his prior connection with the defense team. You should have seen the look on Mr. Kunstler's face when he saw me. He was questioned about if he had looked at the two bite mark photos in the case and had formed an opinion, with a reasonable degree of medical dental certainty? Yes, I did, Dr. Reesner said. They were both caused by the same, they were the same in origin with a reasonable certainty. Both sides agreed that there were only two options for the jury when the case went to trial, acquit or find the defendant guilty of first-degree murder, a capital offense. Lem wants to go all or nothing at all, Kunstler told the press. In a death penalty case, I appeal to the jury's sense of responsibility, the 62-year-old lawyer said during his summation. For once in your life, you have the power of life and death in your hands, he told the jury of six men and six women. Legally that authority is given to very few. You possess it. Consider the total implausibility of the crime taking place the way the prosecution claims it did, Kunstler said, and use it wisely so that you can leave this with your heads held high. Conspiracy theories were offered by the defense because it was the only evidence they had, according to Prosecutor Stanton, who focused on the issues that had already been established. They just threw these things out, hoping one or two of you would latch onto them, he told the jury. Stanton referred to the crucial bite mark impressions on the victim's breast as the only way she could have entered the courtroom, through photographs taken during her autopsy. Through it, she is telling us, the defendant is the one who beat me, the defendant is the one who bit me, the defendant is the one who killed me. When Smith was escorted from the courthouse at the conclusion of the day's proceedings, he said to reporters, if they got any sense, they'll acquit me. Stanton said, I had no doubt from the start that Smith was guilty. 
the jury was given the case for deliberations on April 17. Over the course of the following four days, jurors considered the evidence. On the morning of April 21, a verdict was reached. Smith was found guilty of murder in the first degree and faced a mandatory death sentence. Smith offered to shake the hands of the prosecutors after the verdict, but they all declined, saying that it would have been disrespectful to Donna Pion's memory and what he had done to her. He killed this woman, he's killed others, one of the prosecutors later told reporters. Smith responded to no one in particular, I feel good, as the correction officers led him out in handcuffs. I am at peace with God. Smith, however, couldn't or wouldn't explain how his bite mark was discovered on Donna Pion's body. The New York State Court of Appeals rejected these arguments in People v. Smith, 63 NY 2D 41, decided on July 2, 1984. The majority of the defense's appeals, which were filed with the state of New York after the trial, related to the admissibility of the evidence and statements made by Smith in prior criminal cases. Additional issues presented included the lack of proof beyond a reasonable doubt and the quality of the bite mark evidence. The bite mark on Pion's body was connected to the defendant by the evidence. The remaining circumstantial evidence proved that the defendant had the means to kill Pion and get rid of her body, as well as the chance and access to do so. Therefore, we draw the conclusion that the evidence was sufficiently substantial and credible to persuade us that the jury's verdict that the defendant was guilty beyond a reasonable doubt was appropriate. The appeals court considered and disproved the defense's conspiracy arguments as well. The defense's theory, advanced both during the trial and on appeal, is that Pion was killed as part of a plot involving unidentified correctional officers, who lured her to the institution's east side corridor area using a phone call, killed her in the H block or industry area, and then put her body in the Greenhaven dump truck while it was temporarily abandoned. This argument, which the defendant admits is bizarre, puts Pion outside of the area where she was supposed to be, which suggests that both Pion's murder and the concealment and disposal of her body took place in regions that were very open and accessible to a large number of people. This would have required a very significant conspiracy, which was not supported by the evidence presented during the trial. However, the appeal was not a total failure for the defense team. The court did rule in the defendant's favor on one point, maybe the most important issue of all. In 1983, a conviction in New York of first-degree murder required a mandatory death sentence. Noting that courts have historically struggled to maintain a system of capital punishment at once consistent and principled but also humane and sensible to the uniqueness of the individual, the court felt that current New York state law did not follow those guidelines because it did not allow consideration of any mitigating factors in a death penalty case. Thus, under the standards established by the Supreme Court, wrote Judge K of the State Appeals Court, any death penalty statute which did not provide for consideration by the sentencer of all relevant individual circumstances would be incompatible with the commands of the Eighth and Fourteenth Amendments. Simply put, the court rejected New York state law as unconstitutional and, as a result, Lemuel Warren Smith avoided his date with the electric chair. He was later re-sentenced to an additional life term. Many correctional officers were outspoken in their opposition to the court's controversial decision, which put prison staff in a difficult position. If a lifer inmate wanted to kill a guard, what penalty could he receive? What would be the deterrent? He was already doing life and had nothing to lose. At his sentencing hearing on June 10, 1983, Lemuel Smith expressed his feelings. Think about it, he continued, I have so much time they can't do anything to me. I could sodomize or assault if I wanted to have sex. They are powerless to harm me.